take comfort in the fact that God is sovereign over all the circumstances of your life and praise God in the darkness. Let God's word strengthen your heart. There should be a passion in our heart to tell everybody how they can come to know Jesus Christ. I know you've been standing up and down and treat you to stand one more time. That'd be okay for the reading of scripture. We want to honor God's word. And I want you to look in Mark, Mark chapter three this morning, Mark chapter three. And I just want to read the first six verses of Mark chapter three. If you'll follow along, Mark chapter three, verses one to six. And he entered again into the synagogue and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, stretch forth. And he said unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. And when he had looked around on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth straightway, took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for your word and how it teaches us of the life of our Savior. May our hearts be open and ready to receive what you have for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to speak today, the title of the sermon is The Wrong Way to Come to Church. I'm not talking about directions on how to get here. I'm talking about what happens when you get here. I heard about a woman and her husband, they were on their way home from church one Sunday morning, and she said to him, did you know, notice Mrs. Smith's new dress? And he said, no. She said, well, did you notice Mrs. Jones' new pearl necklace? And he said, no. She said, well, did you notice who Joyce was sitting with? He said, no. He said, well, did, she said, well, did you notice what so-and-so was doing during church? He said, no. She said, well, I don't know why you go to church. You never get anything out of it. <laughs> Not everyone who goes to church benefits from it. In fact, there are some people when they, when they leave church, they are in worse shape than when they came. The Bible even says that. Paul sharply rebuked the Corinthians for their attitude and behavior in church. He said this in 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. Now in this I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you are come together not for the better, but for the worse. Paul said, you're worse off after church than when you were before. You're much worse off, and it was because of their attitude. They were having fellowship meals, and the rich were hoarding their food and not sharing it with the poor. It was to be a time of love and unity, and it wasn't that. And Paul said, I don't praise you in this. You see, your attitude when you come to the house of God is very important. God has something for us each time we come, but we have to be ready to receive it. We have to be ready for what the Lord has. So it depends really upon the condition of your heart. And later on, Jesus will speak about this, the four soils and how the, the, when the seed is spread, there are some places where the seed is spread, it's on hard soil, and the word is not received. So this story in Mark's gospel perfectly illustrates the point. The Pharisees are an example to us of how not to come to worship, how not to come to church. Their bad example should serve as a warning to us all because we definitely don't want to be like them. And you might be sitting here thinking, well, I I don't think that could ever happen to me. I would never be as self-righteous. I would never be as judgmental or as hostile as the Pharisees. But friend, the moment you think it could never happen to you is when you're in danger. Jesus said to his disciples, he said this, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. He warned his own disciples, you don't want to be like them. Leaven was used there as an example of influence. Don't let them influence you. And so what I want you to see here in this story are three dangers we have to avoid when we come to God's house. And it's really based on these Pharisees and how they were there at the synagogue And the first danger I want to mention is this, number one, beware of a critical spirit. 
Because look what happened here. Look in chapter 3 again, verse 1. And he entered, that is Jesus. Notice where it says he entered again into the synagogue. This was on the Sabbath day. And Jesus was faithful to go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now, what is a synagogue? Well, that's where the Jewish people would come to worship. It was the focal point of worship for the Jewish people. Before, the focal place was the temple. But when the Babylonians came and they destroyed the temple and there was no more temple left, the synagogue became the place of worship. And that continued to be so even in Jesus' day. Wherever there are Jews in a town, there's always a synagogue. And back in Jesus' day, whenever you wanted to go to a synagogue, if you went into a town, you weren't familiar with the town, normally they were built on the highest place in that town. And they had a pole that went straight up in the air. So if you would go into a town, you'd look at the pole, and wherever you saw that pole, that was where the synagogue would meet. And Jesus, his habit was, was always to go, when he went into a town, he would go first to the synagogue there and to worship. And so, and by the way, the services at the synagogue were very much like our services today. There was prayer, there was thanksgiving and praises, there were hymns that were sung, and then there was the exposition of Scripture. And so really, a synagogue in Jesus' day, we could say, is the forerunner to the church today. The services were very much alike. And notice the person that Jesus meets here in the synagogue. It says that when he got there, there was a man there with, which had a withered hand. And Mark points this out. The Greek word for withered is a term that refers to atrophy. It was used to speak of dead plants that have dried up and wasted away. And so the idea then is this this man's hand was lifeless. It was incapacitated. In Luke's account, Luke the physician says that this man was, it was his right hand, and that this man was perhaps a stonemason. So this was, the you know, if you're a stonemason, you need to use your hands as a way of living. So it may be that this man was unable to make a living because of this withered hand. But look in verse number 2, it says, and they watched him. That is, this is the Pharisees. They watched too. They watched Jesus. They saw Jesus come into the synagogue, and by the way, he was teaching. They saw the man with the withered hand there, and they were watching to see what Jesus would do. They watched him. Now, by the way, it's a good thing when you come to God's house to put your eyes on Jesus. I always try to make the Lord Jesus clear from the Scripture because He is our strength, He's our inspiration. The Bible teaches us to look unto Jesus. But when they were watching Jesus, it wasn't with a good uh, reason. In fact, they were watching Him. Again, it says in verse 2, whether He would heal Him on the Sabbath day, that they might, what, accuse Him. They wanted to find fault with Jesus. And some scholars believe that the Pharisees purposely planted this man there in the synagogue just to see what Jesus would do. It was a test to see whether Jesus would heal this man on the Sabbath. Now, this really, this whole scene here is a continuation of chapter 2 because if you remember last week, Jesus and his disciples were going to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and they passed through a cornfield and some of Jesus' disciples were hungry and they began to pluck off corn and eat some of that corn. Now, there was nothing wrong with that. There were Jewish laws that allowed for that, that when you were traveling, you could, in moderation, not a lot, but you could take some corn and eat it if you needed sustenance during a trip. And that was according to Jewish law. When the Pharisees saw that, they got angry at Jesus' disciples. They weren't angry, angry because they took the corn. Again, that was Jewish law. You could do that. They were angry because it violated their Sabbath tradition to pluck corn on the Sabbath. And they reminded Jesus about that. And that's why they got angry. As I told you before, the, the Jews back in Jesus' day, they, they basically really misunderstood the purpose of the Sabbath. And in the Old Testament, the laws governing behavior for the Sabbath is kind of general. And so what a lot of the rabbis did is they got together and they came up with these, these thick manuals of things that you can do and you can't do on the Sabbath. They came up with all these laws. You know, some of those laws were ridiculous. Kind of like, uh, you know, our Congress today. They're just constantly making laws. Some of them really are, you know, superfluous. They're really not necessary. But they were making all these laws about the Sabbath. So much so that the Sabbath day ceased to be a day of refreshing and rest. And now it was a burdensome day where they had to make sure that they didn't violate any of these many traditions and laws that were given. 
I mentioned before, the Mishnah said that you, there were 39 ways that you could breach the Sabbath. And each one of those 39 had 39 ways that you could breach the Sabbath. There was 1,521 ways that you could break the Sabbath. You couldn't untie a knot on the Sabbath day. You couldn't swat away a flea on the Sabbath day. Uh, you couldn't wear an outer garment because you might be tempted to take it off and carry it. That would be working on the Sabbath. You could only travel 3,000 feet from your home on the Sabbath day. Anything farther than that would be considered labor. However, they did have a, an exception to that. If you placed a rope and you touched your rope to another building away, that was considered part of your house, so it wasn't traveling. I'm not making this up. This is what they did. You couldn't carry anything heavier than a dried fig. You couldn't wash anything on the Sabbath. You couldn't take a bath because if water spilled out of the tub onto the floor, that was washing. And on the Sabbath day, you couldn't heal. If a person was sick, if they were going to die, you could give them just enough medicine to keep them alive. How they determined that, I have no idea. But you couldn't heal on the Sabbath, which was ridiculous. And so Jesus, when he came along, he just ignored all of those man-made laws because they, were not, they didn't originate with God. This was just rabbis just making laws. A lot of these laws made no sense. And Jesus ignored those laws. And these Pharisees didn't like that. They got angry because he didn't honor their tradition. And now here they were giving him a test to see whether he would heal this man on the Sabbath day. They, were, they had a critical spirit. They had a fault-finding spirit. And here's the thing that we want to avoid, beloved. We want to not have that kind of a spirit. We want to avoid having that, fault-finding, looking for reasons to be critical. I heard about a man who sat watching his, a preacher, a neighbor, nail together a trellis in the backyard, and someone came along and said, what are you, you trying to get lessons on carpentry? He said, no, I just want to hear what the preacher says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. Jesus addressed this in Matthew 7. He said, judge not that you be not judged. Now, this is some lost people's favorite verse. You're not ever supposed to judge. But that's not what Jesus was saying there. He was referring to the Pharisees, and he was talking about their hypercritical spirit. He was saying, don't do that. Don't have a hyperjudgmental, critical spirit. We have to judge. We have to use discernment. We do it all the time in this world. Jesus wasn't saying, don't judge. He was saying, don't be hypercritical. Because whatever judgment you measure out, that's going to be used against you. You want to be judged very uh, critically, then uh, if you do it to others, that's the way God is going to judge you. I, I want God to have mercy on me. And so Jesus said, don't be critical. Don't, don't be like that. But the Pharisees were. Richard, uh, Ray Pritchard said this. He said, fault finders, uh, fault finding is the venom of the soul, he said. Ken Hughes said this, when a critic discovers faults in another, he feels a malignant satisfaction and always sees the worst possible motives in another's action. This is what the Pharisees were like. And we need to be careful that we don't fall into that trap and become so hypercritical. And so they were, had a critical spirit. But here's the second thing, beware of a calloused heart. Look at verse 3. And he said unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. That is, stand, come forward here. Now, Jesus, he could have avoided this whole thing. He could have simply said to this man, and of course, Jesus understood the situation. He knew what they were doing. And he could have said to the man, you know what, come back tomorrow and I'll heal you. But he didn't do that. He says to the man, he calls him out. He says, come forward, come forth. And the man comes forth. And notice that Jesus will now point out their hypocrisy uh, to the uh, Pharisees. And look what he said in verse 4. And he said unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? And so when Jesus calls this man forward, he's showing the need to everyone there. This man had a need. And by this man coming forward, this man is basically saying, I believe, Jesus, that you can help me with this need. But Jesus wanted everyone to, to see that human need takes precedence over ritual or law like that. Human need takes precedence. He wanted them to see him through eyes of compassion. 
but they didn't. And so Jesus kind of turns the tables on them. He asks them a question. And by the way, in Matthew's account, it's a little bit more detailed. This is what Matthew said. And he said unto them, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? And again, Jesus is pointing out their hypocrisy because according to their traditions, it was permissible if you had an animal that fell into a pit on the Sabbath day, they allowed you to pull that animal out of the pit. In fact, they had pits that they dug back then to capture predators like wolves. They were actually uh, to protect the sheep. But sometimes a sheep would fall into that pit. And according to the Sabbath traditions, if your sheep fell into the pit, even if it was on the Sabbath, you could go ahead and pull it out. And yet, it's unlawful to heal a man on the Sabbath? That's kind of inconsistent, isn't it? Kind of like some of our laws today. It's, it's against the law to kill a baby seal, but uh, it's, abortion is, is legal. Doesn't make any sense. And here... Jesus is pointing this out. He says in Matthew 12, 12, How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, is it lawful to do well on the Sabbath day? Jesus said men are better than sheep. Now, people from PETA wouldn't appreciate that. People for the equitable or equal treatment of animals, which is a ridiculous organization, if you ask me. I'm a member of PETA, pastors eating tasty animals. And notice what Jesus says in verse number four. He said it to him like this. Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day or to do evil? It really comes down to a question of sins of commission or omission. If you see a, a person who has a need on the Sabbath and you don't do that, that's evil. It's, it's, it's okay to do good to someone else on the Sabbath. The Sabbath day was never meant to be weighed down with all these ridiculous laws. And if there's someone that has a need on the Sabbath day, isn't it better to do good on the Sabbath day than to do evil? And by the way, Jesus was also pointing out their hypocrisy by saying, look, in a way he was hinting around, you're doing evil, you want to kill me. You're, you're ready to, to kill me on the Sabbath. And here I am, I want to heal this man. So what's, what's more lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil? They were the worst hypocrites there. They were ready to find fault with Jesus for healing a man on the Sabbath when they were ready to kill him on the Sabbath. Shows you the degree of their hypocrisy. And then notice what it says in verse 4. It says uh, they held their peace. When Jesus asked that question, they held their peace. Verse 5, and when he had looked around about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said unto the men, stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored whole as the other. First of all, they held their peace. And what that means there is this was a peace not because they didn't know how to answer it, because they were silence and stubbornness. They refused to answer him. And then the Bible says in verse 5, he looked on the hardness of their heart. This is the Greek word porosi. It's a medical term which describes the process of mending a bone. And in using this phrase, we get the picture of a heart that is so calcified, that is so hard, that it can't be made soft again. Their heart was hardened. And it was really a sinful attitude that hardened their heart. It was a settled disposition against God. It was a constant pushing away of the truth, pushing back the truth, holding back the truth, a stubborn resistance that hardened their heart. This is a danger we need to avoid, beloved. The Bible constantly warns believers to don't harden your heart. Don't resist the truth when the truth is preached. Isn't it interesting how people can come to church and hear the same message and some people will be convicted and God will use it to bless them and other people will grow harder as a result of hearing that truth. The same sun that melts the ice hardens the clay. And it's really a... a, a, a Depended on us, our own heart condition. And so we see the hardness, the hard-heartedness of these people there. And then we see the healing where Jesus says to the man, stretch forth your hand, and he stretches it out. And just an amazing thing, his hand is made completely whole, right there in front of everybody in the synagogue. 
His hand is just completely restored. This dead limb is brought back to life. And it's made just like the other hand. What an incredible miracle that is. And, and put yourself in this man's position to have that happen to him. And here's this man who comes to Jesus. He realizes his need. He obeys Jesus. He just simply stretches forth his hand. Probably it was a hard thing to do. When Jesus said, stretch forth your hand, probably in that condition it was very difficult, maybe even painful. Friend, if you want the help of Jesus, just, just do what he says. It may not be easy. It may be difficult. It might even be painful. But if you do what he says, you know what? He'll bless you. He'll heal you. He'll do what you need. And that's what happens to this man. He recognized his need. He recognized that Jesus had the ability to help him. And he obeyed the command of Christ and he was healed instantly. I don't know what your problem might be, but I tell you this, Jesus can solve it. He can take care of it. But here's the third thing we need to be aware of. Beware of a critical spirit. Beware of a calloused heart. But also here's the third thing. Beware of a closed mind. Look in verse number 6. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Again, here's this incredible miracle. You would think that the Pharisees would say at that moment, this must be the Son of God. Look at this incredible miracle. But that's not what they did. They, the Bible says, took counsel with the Herodians. And so basically, they reject his miracles. And they take counsel with Herodians. Who were the Herodians, by the way? The Pharisees normally would never dare associate with the Herodians. The Herodians were followers of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was loyal to Rome in that whole political system. And the Pharisees hated the rule of Rome. And they had nothing to do with the Herodians. But here in this situation, they counseled with the Herodians. It's the old saying that an enemy of my enemy is my friend. Because... They wanted to use the Herodians and to destroy the Lord Jesus. So they began plotting how they might put him to death. You know why? Because they already made up their minds to say, we will not believe him. They were pushing away the truth about Jesus Christ. All the miracles that Jesus did were to authenticate that he was indeed the Son of God. You remember Nicodemus in John 3 who came to Jesus by night and said, no man can do these miracles that you do except God were with him. This shows that you're of God. But that's not the conclusion that these Pharisees came to. In fact, later on in chapter 3, we don't have time to look at it today. We're just about out of time. But they said that Jesus does miracles by the power of Satan. The ultimate blasphemy against Christ. So they reject his miracles. They reject his message. Luke's account tells us that when Jesus was in the synagogue before this miracle took place, he was teaching them. Wouldn't you like to sit under the teaching of Jesus himself? Talk about an incredible experience. Here is the living word of God teaching from the written word. What a wonderful experience. And rather than them benefiting from the word of God being taught, they just simply grew harder because they constantly pushed away the truth. On Sunday night, we're studying Romans, and this reminds me of the passage in Romans 1 where Paul says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven continually against mankind. Why? Because man holds the truth in unrighteousness, and the word for hold there is to push away, to hold back the truth. That's what mankind does today. Rather than embrace the truth of the word of God, the truth about Christ, they were holding it back, they were pushing it back, and that sort of thing angers God. And Paul said that's the reason for the wrath of God upon people today. And so we have to have a heart that's open and receptive to the truth of the word of God. A heart that wants to learn the deeper things of God. Like the psalmist said in Psalm 25, 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. And so these... Pharisees, they left church in worse condition than when they came because of the condition of their heart. And beloved, I say to you that when we come to God's house, we always need to be ready to receive what God has for us. 
we have to beware of a critical spirit because that will hinder us from growing in Christ. We have to beware of a calloused heart, a hard heart. We have to beware of a closed mind. And we have to be open to all the truth that God has for us so that we might grow in Christ. Let's bow for prayer together today, dear friend. We're out of time today. And so, Father, I pray that you will help this word that we've received today to be heeded by every person that's here. That, Lord, we would guard our heart to make sure our heart is not hardened against the truth, but that we're open and receptive to receive what you have for us each time we come to your house. And, Father, I pray that if there's someone here today that has never yet turned to Christ and invited Christ into their heart, I pray, Lord, that they would see that he is the Son of God, that he is the Savior of the world who died for their sins, that they would come to Christ today and receive him. And with heads bowed and eyes closed, friend, just before we close out our service, I just want to take this moment to ask you here to examine your heart before God. What condition is your heart in? Have you harbored a critical spirit? Don't let that continue. Just confess it. Repent of it. Ask God to renew your heart. To renew your mind. And if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, friend, I just want to invite you to take a moment and realize that Christ is the only way of salvation. He came into this world to die for your sins. And on the cross, all of your sins was placed upon him. And he paid your sin debt. God is a holy God. He must judge sin. But God is a God of love. He doesn't want to judge you. So that, therefore, all of your sins were placed on Christ. And now salvation is a gift that you can receive just by putting your faith in him. And if you've never done that, friend, I invite you to do it today. And right there where you are, would you be willing to pray and say, Jesus, I'm receiving this moment, the gift of salvation through what Christ did for me. I turn from my sin. I turn to you, Lord Jesus. Save me. And friend, if you pray that, he will save you. And we want to pray with you. We want to encourage you along. So if you're here, I just say... We're glad you've joined us today for this broadcast of The Ever Living Story, a media outreach of Grace Bible Baptist Church in Catonsville, Maryland. It's our sincere prayer that this broadcast has touched the spiritual needs of your heart. The Lord Jesus Christ has come into this world to change our lives, to bring us eternal life. And Grace is a local congregation where the Word of God is very clearly preached as you've just seen. Our Sunday morning service starts at 11 a.m., so you still have time to join us. We're located just off exit 17 of the Baltimore Beltway at 1518 North Rolling Road, Catonsville, Maryland. Let me leave you with this thought. Remember, the Lord Jesus Christ has changed your life and he wants you to live out every day of it for his ever-living story.